My name is Raina Shelton. I am the children's pastor at West Coast Church. Woo! And I play the ukulele. Yeah. <laughs> hey guys, remember that breakout session where you had we had cookies and we played ukulele and we got wrapped? <laughs> to the chocolate chips of the ministry. I have been in ministry probably for about 15 years and I have done everything from cleaning toilets to kids ministry to youth ministry to church finances to office admin to worship to worship team playing keys on the worship team to graphics and production you name it if it's been in the church I have probably done it at least once to find out I didn't like it. So <laughs> um, I have I love the church it's my heart I love everything about it, and I, from a young age, I just fell in love with Jesus. I came from a family that was not Jesus, it was very toxic, very abusive, and I longed for love. So when I came to the church and I heard about this God who loved me, at first I didn't believe it because I was like, there's no way that God is real. If God is real, he does not care about me. He does not want me. If he did, why would he let me live in a house where people who were supposed to protect me were the same people? And I just grew up with this neglect and this abandonment, and I didn't want to hear about this new love of Jesus. And so, but when I went, because I saw a cute boy, <laughs> God just stirred my heart. And I couldn't understand church. I didn't know what I was experiencing, but I knew it was something new, and I wanted it. And regardless of what position you serve, this is not a kids' ministry workshop. I want you to take that in because sometimes when people hear kids ministry if you're not a kids pastor everyone tunes out this is not a kids ministry workshop this is a ministry workshop whether you're on the worship team you're a lead pastor you work in the office um you clean the toilets uh if you apply this to whatever position you are serving in and your heart is open god will use it to help you you have to take what you receive from this conference and dissect it and take what you need and apply it to you because god's God's word is universal. That's right. right. It, there are no barriers. There are no. It's not defined by your position. Okay. So I just want to get that out there first, um, because God's prepared something for you today. I didn't start in kids ministry. I actually started serving, helping out my youth pastor at different events. And I remember one particular event. Um, pastor Nancy Turpin, the OG. Hmm. I had one more task to do. Like, you know that last task before you go home and there's yep. freedom? Absolutely. And I had left school, went to church, worked at the church, set up for this big event, and my last task was to set up this table. And I was so ready to leave. <laughs> and I went to my pastor and I was like, hey, we set up the table. Am I good to go? Is it okay if I, if I leave now? And she's like, okay, well, let me check out the table and then sure, honey, you can leave. So she goes and checks out the table into like, my sadness and horror, she was not impressed with it. And so she looks at it and she's like, Rena. And I was like, what? She's like, the tablecloth is crooked. And I was like, so? <laughs> and she's like, the tablecloth is crooked, Rena. She's like, fix it. And I did the, you know, the teenager side, the, ugh. I was like, Miss Nancy, it's not a big deal. Nobody cares. It's a little off. Nobody cares. And she looked at me with the most straight face and said, it is me. This is God's house. This is God's ministry. When people come into this event tomorrow, we are a reflection of how the world in our community experiences God. And we don't give slop. That's not what we do here. She's like, that's not your best. It takes two seconds to fix it. Just fix it. And it was like a oh <laughs> moment for me where at first I was a little offended because no I had to stay two my job was terrible three fine I'm a terrible Christian too and so I had to have this humbling moment where I was like you're right I need to do my best for God and that was the first time I realized that little things matter in your ministry little things make a big difference and for me as a young teenager I didn't understand that and the reason we're talking about chocolate chips today is because chocolate chips are a little piece in a cookie, right? They're just a small little, little chunks, just little pieces. 
but that is what enhances and changes the whole recipe. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's what takes a regular cookie graham cracker. I had to ask somebody, what's a chocolate chip cookie without chocolate chips? I actually <laughs> don't know what it is. Um, this like little sugar or graham cookie and takes it and enhances it to a whole new recipe that transcends the test of time. When you ask somebody what is a classic traditional <laughs> cookie, they're gonna think chocolate chip. Mm -hmm. And that came to be because of a few small changes to the recipe. And so your ministry is probably in one of three stages. It's either in the sinking stage where you're losing people, there's been a division in your church, something happened, um, and it's don't know what else to do people aren't coming like they used to you've tried everything you're at a floating stage where what you're doing is working but nothing really changes nothing drops nothing increases or you're in a really great season of ministry where life is sailing no icebergs in sight you are good to go but even if you are in a sailing stage where you're doing good um, even in your position spiritually healthy in your ministry with your team there will be a time where you're not you're not moving and you're going to need to know what to do when that happens so if you will apply these little things and if you already have them in your ministry to improve them analyze them, really check them i believe that it is going to help you so welcome to the chocolate chips of ministry now that i've already talked your ear off and we haven't even got started it's great welcome to the first point you will see your sheet um if you didn't get one we do have them on the table miss diana will happily Film while someone else gets you the sheets. Well, I think I got everything. It's pretty so, C is for creativity. Everyone say creativity. Creativity. We are in a world where we cannot afford to not be creative. And I know what this is my typical response. I always get, Rena, I'm not creative. I'm not a creative person. I have creative people on my team, but creativity is not my strong suit. I want to tell you that that is not true. We were created by a creator who is creative. We are designed in his image. Creativity lives in you. I'm not telling you you got to paint a Picasso. I'm not saying that. What I am saying is that you can use creativity in your ministry. You may be creative with building or decorating or designing or be creative in the way that you structure sermons or the way that you do outreaches. But we live in a world where the world is trying to grab the attention in the heart of the people. And if we don't step up to their level, Disney should not be better than us. A restaurant down the street with Taco Tuesday should not be more fun than the church. The world is exciting. They're fun. They're uplifting. And you can stay in a stagnant state, do the same thing you've always done, do your services the same way you've always done them, use the same graphics you've always done. And it can be great and it can work. But you will not get new families. You will not grab attention. You have to be creative in your approach to reaching your community. Because if you don't, how can your church and your ministry grow if it never changes? Yeah. And what you're doing may be working, but could it be better? Yeah. Did you know the average attention span of a human is only 8.25 seconds? Jeez. Wow. <laughs> wow. Wow. The average attention span of a human being is 8.25 seconds. Do you know how big the attention span of a goldfish is? Nine. <laughs> what? <laughs> wow. So we have officially reached the age where goldfish have a better, bigger attention span. <laughs> and if that doesn't tell you that we have to be on the move with trying to figure out how to keep people's attention to where they know that the church is alive, that God is still good, God is still real, the yeah. church is not going anywhere, the yeah. church is not dead. Yeah. They have a, We have a reputation that we are hateful, that we are boring, right. that we are for people who are 105 years old, who read from books and don't believe that love is a real thing, that we just hate and judge people have to shift the narrative because otherwise if we don't speak up and use creative approaches nothing is going to change and people are not going to believe that yeah. they're going to believe what the world tells them because the world is the only one who's vocal yeah. so we have to use creative approaches what does that look like for you this could mean um you do a creative outreach our church is doing a creative outreach right now where we're doing uh, wonderland christmas for wonderland um so it's a Christmas experience where people come. We have tents outside. They can make ornaments with their families. There's going to be live singing. There's going to be food, cookies, cocoa. Um, kids can come and see Santa. But we also tell the nativity story. And it is not this big church sermon. It is not this big message. 
it is a hug from the church to the community yeah. where they see they get to hear the gospel but they also get to experience love and realize wow you know what's going to happen is they're going to drive by and see a wonderland banner and be like what is that i've never heard of that this is new i want to know what it is everybody wants to be a part of something yeah. so you have to use creativity in your ministry jesus was created in his approaches he rubbed dirt on people's faces he, threw <laughs> the sand. he, he was he was not a sit behind the pulpit do the same thing every day he traveled he did different places he talked to different people he did different things and we cannot afford to be uncreative in our positions um so it could look like decorating different it could look like adding illustrations to your messages um, object lessons are a big deal. People remember them. They, 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 people are visual. They're not just auditory. And so when you give them an auditory message and you give them a visual message, you just doubly connect with them. I think doubly is not even a word. I just made it up. But it's going to work today. Um, it could be changing the layout of your services. When people expect the same thing every week. Maybe you move your worship to the end. Preach a fire message and do a worship series then. Um, change the way that you do your worship practice. Change the way that you meet with your teams. Try a different day. If something's not working, you have to shift and try and figure out what works. If nothing changes, then nothing changes. Your ministry will stay the same. Your sheep will stay the same. And sadly, you will stay the same. Mm. H is for honesty. And typically when you hear honesty, you think um, people are talking about being transparent, right? honest, living holy, living the authentic life, but I just want to hit it from a different perspective. Anybody in here get frustrated with their volunteers? Just, just, just me. <laughs> I'll say it. I get, sorry, Sierra. She's one of my teammates. Um, I get frustrated with them too. It, it can be frustrating working with other people, relying on other people, and I can remember a time where I, I'm raw with God. Like, I, I talk to God like he's my therapist because he is the great counselor. And I'm like, God, these people are tripping. They are, they are on my last nerve. They're, they, why don't they just show up on time and do what they're supposed to do? It's not hard. Like, straighten the table. <laughs> so, like, it's easy and, um, to get frustrated because you're relying on other people. And you, they're not going to have the same heart as you. Right. Yeah. It's your ministry. It's good. And so I was so upset and I was talking to God. I was like, these people won't do X, Y, Z. These people are getting on my nerves. I I don't even want to do this anymore. Let them do it. I'm just not going to. I'm just going to be late. I'm not going to show up. I'm not going to do my job. And let's see how it goes. <laughs> and I remember God was like, okay, what about you? You got a lot to say about them. Yeah. But what about you? Yeah. Mm. And I was like, I am perfect. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I had to, God checked me. Yeah. And he's like, you got a lot to say about them. And I had to sit down and be like, wow, I needed to be honest and do an evaluation on myself. Yeah. Wow. That thing that I said I was going to fix three months ago is still broken. Mm -hmm. Wow, that team member didn't do what they were supposed to do, but I did not communicate effectively so that they could succeed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow, I had a really bad attitude and was wondering why everybody else wasn't chipper and ready for Jesus. I don't, I'm like, I am, am I drama? Am I the problem? <laughs> yes, yes. And God was like, you have to be real. You're honest about everyone else and their performance, but you give yourself a little more grace than you give them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's good. Be hard on yourself. Yeah. Be honest. That's good. What are you doing that you know is not right? What are you doing that you know you procrastinate? You know you don't take that as serious as you should. Yeah. You know you did not put as much prep time in your message that you should have. You know that you did not practice those songs before you came to the worship practice. You know that you did not do what you were supposed to. You know you were supposed to tell your team that. You were supposed to check on that parent. You were supposed to do that thing. And you did not follow through. Yeah. That's on you. That's good. So but good. we don't want to say that. We want to say, I was busy. I was tired. This thing came up, and we have all these excuses, and we wonder why our ministry isn't getting better because we're not getting better. That's yeah, it. Because so good. we're not being authentic and honest with ourselves. Something that we always try to teach our team is to do a SWOT. 
and that's in your questions. Um, SWAT, the SWAT review, it will be what is your strengths, what is your weaknesses, what is your opportunities, and what is your threats. So that's a self-evaluation. We usually do it with our ministry team after our service. So we'll be like, all right guys, well it's our strengths this week. Uh, this kid gave his heart to Jesus, or so-and-so improved on their skit dramatically this week. Um, what are your strengths? What, is, what are my strengths as a leader? I'm a, I'm a really good communicator. For me, my biggest strength is my creativity. I Creativity is my superpower. Mm -hmm. um, weaknesses. My weaknesses is my time management. I, I'm trying to do everything at a million miles. I don't say no to nobody. <laughs> I'm like, yes, I'll do that. Yes, I'll do that. Yes, I'll do that. My team is laughing because they know. I'll be, I'll be the yeah. first one to at work and I'll leave. Everyone's gone. They'll come back the next day. I'm still there. <laughs> <laughs> I'm terrible with my time management. Opportunities. Um, an opportunity you could have is finding a resource to that thing that you don't know how to do. Mm -hmm. Okay, you struggle with um, working on a document. Who can you reach out to to get what you need for that? Um, graphics is not your strong suit. What program or software can I use to make that easy? Who do I know that can help me with my website? <laughs> I don't know. Oh. And, and, and oh. Look for those opportunities that you don't make excuses. Look for opportunities yeah, to yeah. get better. Yeah. Go to a training. Go to an experience conference. Come on. Um, threats. If you, there's something spiritual not right with you, that is a threat. When you are leading people to Jesus and sitting in private and won't come to your leaders about it because you're afraid you're going to get condemned or whipped or taken off the team, that is a big sign that you should be taken off the team. Yeah. And being taken off the team doesn't mean that you have failed. It means that you need time to heal. You need time to refocus. And that's okay. Every leader wants to hide when they do something they know that they're not supposed to do. But if you can't be transparent with that and you are a secret sinner, that's a threat. Yeah. A threat is you found out a kid got hurt and you didn't fill out an incident report. You're terrible with incident. That is a huge threat. You get sued. <laughs> not doing your office admin, not filling out checks and getting checks out on time. Your lights get shut off at your church. That is a threat. <laughs> Luckily, you've never had to experience that. Angie's always on time. Woo! On time. Yeah. <laughs> so, H is for honesty. Be honest with yourself. I is for intentionality. Everyone say intentionality. Intentionality. Yeah. Ruth Graves Wakefield created the famous chocolate chip cookie in the 1930s. And there are different stories on how. Some people say it was an accident. What are you laughing at, Gary? I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, I didn't even say anything funny yet. No, no. <laughs> Some people say that she did it on purpose. Uh, some people say that she was making her regular cookies and some chips fell in by accident. Uh, but one thing is she was do know is she is a she was a chef she was a baker at an inn so she was experienced with food and Carrie who's also experienced with food he's a chef not me I make Roma noodles that's the extent of what I got um, you try new things right you experiment with flavors you do different things you have to be intentional with your ministry you have to try things experiment figure out what's working what's not working be honest about what's not working even if you think it's a great idea, even if it's working for the next church, it may not work for you. It may not work for your worship team or the way that you do the office or the way that you do the youth ministry. Sometimes you have to change things, but you have to be intentional. If you try nothing, nothing happens. Yeah. But here's something that I want to challenge you. It is really, really common for people to look on the next church's Instagram and want to copy what they do. They're bigger, they're cooler, yeah. they're better. Yeah. We need to be like them. What they're doing, they're reaching. Oh, they 500 people got baptized, and only two got baptized at our church. We suck. <laughs> and so we live in this comparison state. Yeah. And it causes us to implement things in our ministry that are not of God. That's good. Yeah. That's good. So we good. will implement things because we saw them and thought they were trendy or thought that that's what we need to do, but that's never what God intended us to for our ministry. Yeah. And we we are really bad for being churches that are like, God, come in the room. God, fill your spirit. 
make everybody cry so I feel good about my message. Lord, save the room. We invite God's presence, but we don't invite him on the basic things of how we do ministry. Because we got that. God, I can make my own orange sheet. I can plan my services. God, I know how the room is supposed to look. God, I know what I'm supposed to do. I got this. Can you just show up? I'm a, I'll do everything. I'll even come up with my own ideas for sermons and write my own words and say that they're yours. But can you just show up and make everybody cry and make me feel like you got saved? And what happens is we are intentional, but we're, our intentions are not lining up with God's intentions. When God built the temple, he was very specific. He had yeah. measurements, he got fabrics, he had textures picked out. He was ready to go. He knew exactly how ministry was supposed to look. But we don't ask God about that stuff. We ask God to make people feel. We ask God to change our hearts. We ask God to, to make us, heal us of all of our hurts and heal all the people, which is good stuff. We want people to be saved. We want people to be healed. We want people to be empowered. But I want to do ministry the way God wants me to do ministry. Yeah. I want my church to look like the way God wants my church to look. Not 5,000 people, 700 saved church down 7-7 Heaven Road and <laughs> compare myself and feel like I'm not called, I'm not qualified, I can't do this, my ministry is awful, no one's going to get saved because my church doesn't look like that church, and I'm doing everything I can, but I'm not good enough. And what's the point? Be intentional, but not intentional of comparison and trying to be like someone else. God has his own plan for your ministry, your church, your youth group, your kids' ministry, your office, your worship team. God has his, his own plan for them. And so it's important that we are making sure that we are aligned with that. God is intentional. We say it's no big deal, but when you do not align your intention with God's intention, you make your ministry about you. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's good. You're like, well, I did good today. My message was awesome. So many people complimented me. Man, I sang that so good. I killed that song. And it may be true. You may have done a great job. But when you start to take your eyes and the glory off of him and put it on you, you endanger yourself That's right. because you have taken your eyes off of Jesus. Wow. So good. And when you take your eyes off of Jesus, how in the world can you lead someone else to put their eyes on wow. And so we have to be intentional. The third is P which is, oh, that's four, right? The four, yeah. Four, yeah. P is for people. Everyone say people. People. People are your ministry. Not just in the congregation, but on your team. Jesus didn't do ministry by himself. And sometimes we feel like it'd be easier if we could. <laughs> you know what? It'd just be easier if I just do it myself. I, I spend more time train the volunteers that don't want to commit then and retrain the volunteers that don't want to commit so they want to commit until they realize it's working yeah mm -hmm. and that's when people want title but they don't want to sacrifice mm -hmm. that's and, good. Um, but it wastes our time because i'm like i gotta train somebody that really wanted to be here but that's how you learn and they know that if they do ever want to serve that they are to serve them. yeah so it's never really time wasted but what i really want to hone in on is Jesus didn't do ministry at all. He had people with him. Not just doing ministry, but walking, traveling, doing life with him. And ministry can be very lonely. Especially the higher you are, when you're a lead pastor, kids pastor, youth pastor, you can't share stuff with everybody. You've got to be private. You've got to protect your family. And the closest people to you in church can be the same people your name through the mud and they will hurt you and make you never want to get close to anybody ever again especially when they hurt your family you're like absolute absolute i will put my christianity down and ask for forgiveness later and what's important is for you to be careful with who you surround yourself with mm -hmm. in your ministry not just in your ministry but you as a minister because if you're on a worship team or you're working in the office you are a minister in some form. You are helping people get closer to Jesus. That's ministry. You are a minister. Congratulations. You have been promoted. <laughs> um, and I do this thing 
and I've done it for a few years now. And um, me and my husband were talking because he, he mentioned it in the shower, and I was like, <laughs> so he thinks he gave it to you, but I promise, babe. I'm gonna, give, I'm gonna shout you out because you remind me. But um, I do this thing every so often. I try to do it every year where I pick 12 people. Mm -hmm. I pick 12 people, just like Jesus. Jesus had 12 people. I cannot save my whole congregation. And what happens is, as in ministry, we have this pressure that we have to get every birthday party, call every single person who's sick, make sure everybody's volunteered. Oh, this person doesn't doesn't serve anymore. They quit coming to church. It's my fault. I should have said something. I should have checked on them. I didn't do my job well enough. And we have this pressure to be responsible for everybody's spiritual well-being, which we do have a sense of responsibility to teach them truth. But we are not responsible to hold their hand through every step of their life. But it's hard not to when you love them. Come on. You cannot be responsible for all of those people. It burns you out. It makes you tired. It makes you exhausted. It makes you feel like nothing you do is ever good enough. But if you can hone in on 12 people that you love, people that um, encourage you, help you in ministry, people that are could be your mentors, 12 people that you can really hone in on and invest in and connect people with. Because what happens is people come to our church and they feel like a number. They're like, oh, pastor only calls me when he needs me. Oh, I only hear from Pastor Katie when she has a youth event. She never takes me out for coffee. She never hangs out with me. She never checks on me. I only hear from I only hear from my church when they need me. And that that's what makes people quit coming to church. Yeah. That's what makes people not want to serve. When the only time their phone rings is when you want them to come to a meeting, when you need help set up. I I, I text a volunteer one time um, to ask them something, and something just made me I, it had to be Jesus because I wouldn't have done it otherwise. I was like, look through your text messages with this person. And I'm like, wow, the only time I text them is when, no wonder people feel used by the truth. So if you can focus on 12 and being intentional with them and just occasionally going down the list, okay, I haven't asked this person how their family is. Oh, you know what? I need to have a coffee date with this person. I should take this person out to lunch. They help me 12 months out of the year. I can pay, I can buy their tacos this week. It's not, it's not gonna kill me. It's actually a lot cheaper than hiring somebody. <laughs> And really investing into those people because what happens when you invest in those 12 people, you get them connected, you get them encouraged in their faith, you pray with them, you talk to them, they grow closer to Jesus, then they mentor 12 people, yeah. and that one investment, you have reached 144 people for Jesus. So good. By focusing on 12. You have spread that, and now those people can come, and they're like, hey, like I love my church, I'm a part of it now, I'm not just a number. My pastor cares about me. My worship team loves me. My kids minister calls me to say hi. <laughs> Obviously, you have to be careful, gender-based, age-based. Um, all my 12 are girls. I'm not calling nobody's husband. Come on. <laughs> I ain't texting nobody's. No 16-year-old boy in my youth ministry. Uh, I'm not doing that because those are boundaries you have to have. Right? My husband better not have no girls on his list. <laughs> <laughs> if not, I can take them off real quick. <laughs> Let me check on them, babe. I got them. Don't ever talk to us. <laughs> so, uh, but if you can focus on 12, then you can build that, grow that. So good. Am I going on time? Yep. Okay. You got four minutes. And out of those 12, you should have a core three. This is extremely hard for lead pastors and head pastors. Sorry. Um, my pastors are not going to come to me if their marriage is in trouble. Why? They're my boss. They're not going to share that with me. That is personal, private information that I am not equipped to help them with. They're going to go to Terry Reaver. They are going to. They have a family in their church that they've grown up with that they can trust. Because lead pastors have it really hard because people people get close. And there's a position of authority that you have that there's a really thin boundary line. But what happens is as a lead pastor, as a worship leader, as a kids pastor, whatever position you work in, you can feel alone in your position. You feel like nobody cares about you. Nobody sees you. You can't connect with anybody. That makes you feel like you can't do it. You need some, you need cheerleaders. You need people that are going to encourage you and say, 
hey, like, I know you feel really bad about how service went, but it's okay. Like, we're going to make it. How can we make it better? How can I help you? Man, like, you played the wrong note. It's okay. Like, it's me too, man. I've done that too. It's all right. Mm -hmm. Or, oh, you're having a trouble with this person in your church. Let me tell you about something that happened that can help you. Have people in your circle that can also help you and encourage you. But those core three, non-negotiable. They have to be people you can trust. They have to be people who are spiritually sound. As much as you love Aunt Betsy, if Aunt Betsy ain't saved and getting drunk every weekend, she cannot encourage you in your ministry. In fact, she'll tell you to go, come out drinking with me and we'll talk about it. You need to have three sound spiritual people who can mentor you and encourage you. Who are your 12? Who are your close three? Those are, I think, questions in your thing. Which I'll, I'll put those up so you guys don't get them. It's okay. Last but not least is my favorite. My least. <laughs> my least. Oh, man. My least mastered skill. But I'm working, guys. I'm being transparent. I'm being transparent. <laughs> S is for Sabbath. <laughs> Your ministry can't be effective if you're not rested. Yeah. Yeah. And we have this pressure to do the job. The job must be completed. And it must be completed with excellence unto the Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. There's always more work to do. There's always something else to do. You will work at the church a million hours, especially with the way that volunteers work sometimes. And ministry will end up coming before your spouse. It'll come before your kids. It'll come before your mental health. And you will find yourself in a place when you are not rested. Your mind believes things that are not true. Your mind will begin to make you question your calling. Your mind will be will begin to cause you to be offended with people that you love and people that you work with at your church because you are not in the right mindset. Because you are tired and you are offended and you are upset, you are sad, you are lonely, you're discouraged because your body keeps the score. So what happens when you are not getting and maintaining and prioritizing that rest is that's when your brain will say, You can't do this. Your congregation doesn't need you. Those youth kids would be so much better without you. Anyone else can do their job. Your creative ideas, they're trash. They're pretty awful. Awesome. You, you're not good enough. You should just resign. You know, you think God called you? Really? Like, God didn't call you. God can't use you. Look at the other person who's singing right next to you that sounds so much better. Look at the lead pastor down the street. That person that you think loves you, that's on your team, See how terrible they treat you? You overanalyze. It makes you question things that are not of God. They are not true. They are lies caused by your subconscious and by the enemy taking advantage of you in a vulnerable state. Yeah, you did not prioritize rest. God did not suggest rest. He commanded it. That's right. It's good. But we don't. We say, I, I'll rest when it's done. I'm guilty. Y'all, I may. My team will tell you, I may work. <laughs> A hall. It's mm -hmm. sick. Mm -hmm. it's, I have a problem. Yes. I'm aware. It is. It is literally. It is terrible. Am I right? Yeah. It's getting, it better. It's getting better. But you know why it's getting better? Because my lead pastor makes it better. Yeah. My. We have the best pastors. No offense yes, to any pastors do. in the world. They are awesome. Yeah. Highly, ten out of ten recommend if you need anything. Call them. They will counsel you through anything. Yep. Um, they are for the people. <laughs> they are for the people. <laughs> my. Um, they are my pastor parents. They loved me when I was a teenager and have led me in every area of ministry. And my pastor will come in and she'll say, because uh, they're they're both our head pastors to me. I don't know about y'all, uh, Pastor Nancy, Pastor Nancy, but Pastor Nancy will come in and she'll be like, "What are you doing?" And I'm like, "I'm working." And she's like, "Why are you still here? Go home." And I'll be like, "But I no, go home." And I'm like, "But I'm not finished." <laughs> And she's like, Rena, it's going to be here tomorrow. She's like, you're tired. Go home, get some rest, and you'll be able to think clearly and be more productive. Or if she knows that we had a big event, she'll tell us all, hey, don't come in until noon, guys. You stayed late. We had this meeting. When you overwork your team and you're overworked, your team and your church is not effective. In fact, they resent you. Your team will resent you. You ever felt like you were called for a million things throughout the church the whole week, and you're just like, I would, I would rather be anywhere, anywhere but here right now. 
I'm so thankful because our I could not control that. I will work. I will work until I get a fall off. I just I, it's my nature. I want to do a good job. I want to please my pastors. I, I feel like I have to work harder than everybody else to value my position. I feel like if I don't work hard enough, people won't be saved. They won't love Jesus. And they won't go to heaven. It's going to all be my fault because I didn't work hard enough. And that's not true. God has called you. And I love the story of Elijah because Elijah was this amazing prophet who literally called fire from the sky. <laughs> and he was in such a discouraging place where he was tired and unrested, where he's like, God, just kill me. I can't do I can't do this anymore. I and God's like, eat a snack and take a nap, you're fine. <laughs> and I feel like that. That's literally how I feel sometimes. I'm like, just give me a snack and let me take a nap. I'm good. And then I'm ready to go. Yeah. But we don't we don't we don't do that. We don't prioritize that. We do that when we're burnt out, when we're tired, when we're mad. And we're like, I can't help it, so now I'm gonna now I'm gonna rest. But we're already mad, we're already discouraged. And so take a nap. Know your boundaries. What do you need to do to prioritize rest? Does that mean you have to say no to some things? Does that mean that you need to say, hey, um, this isn't working. I need to rearrange my schedule. Hey, I'm leaving on time. My, my goal this week is to leave work on time every day this what? week. Okay. Wow. <laughs> That'd be a miracle. That I was going to say. Be... Listen, guys, I'm working on it. I'm preaching to myself, y'all. I know. Um, but you have to prioritize rest because I realize that when I do not prioritize rest, that's when I am my most vulnerable and I am in trouble. Mm -hmm. And your ministry cannot thrive with burnt out, tired, resentful leaders. And you cannot be effective in your ministry when you are resentful and you're tired and you're exhausted. If you don't have the volunteers to execute what you want to do, then you say, I'm going to stop what I'm doing in this particular season. And I'm going to seek God to refill me and give me yeah. the ideas I need to get the volunteers I need to do the things that God has called me to do. Because right now, this is not working. And if I keep going like this, I'm going to quit. Mm -hmm. And that's not what God wants. And so you have to get rest. And make sure your team gets rest. Because when you rest, you give your team permission. Yeah. Sometimes uh, your team won't rest because they don't see you resting. And yeah. so they're like, I can't rest. And my <laughs> lead pastor is not... Our lead pastor is crazy, guys. We'll come outside and he's cutting trees. He's like 70 years old. He's unclogging toilets. We had a Christmas meeting. He's hanging light fixtures. I'm like, Pastor, literally anyone in the church can do that. Anyone would help you do that. And when he rests, he gives me permission that I'm like, okay, I can rest now because my, my pastor's going to rest. And so set the, set the tone for your team. And don't okay. punish your team when they tell you that they're too tired. Yeah. So there's volunteers that don't commit and they don't follow through. That's one thing. There are good volunteers that sometimes need a break. Yeah. And we cannot punish them for that. Because then they will work and feel like they have failed you and failed ministry. And that's not the case sometimes. Okay, I'm going to pull you off rotation for a little while. Okay, you know what? You can sit this event out. You just come and receive. You don't serve. That's it. Last but not least, we're just going to close out. I'm going to, Norris, you can put the questions up just so they can fill that out if they don't have it on their sheet to fill out the little answers. This isn't something you got to necessarily, obviously you can do whatever you want, but if you take this home and really reflect on your ministry, throw on a worship song, really reflect on it. God, how can I apply these to my ministry? How can I improve? I promise you, God will fill your brain with creativity. When you're hungry, God knows. When your heart is willing, God knows. And when you think you know more than everybody else and you can't be taught anything else, that's when God's like, okay, you can't learn from anybody. You can't learn from me either, so have fun. Do what always does work. work. And if you're at the experience conference, to me that is a sign that you care. That's a sign that you care about what you do. You care about the kids that you serve. You care about the people that you meet. And you want more for you. You want more for your ministry. You want more for your church. Healthy leaders produce healthy leaders. Healthy so leaders good. make up healthy church. So good. If you are not healthy, and you are letting little things that seem like basic knowledge or little things that don't seem like they make a big deal, you're missing an opportunity to make your ministry. And 
I just want to encourage you before you leave. No one else is called to your position. You are called to your position. You are at your church specifically for a reason. You are the kids pastor for 30 plus years because God wanted you there. He knew that those particular kids needed to hear from you. And no one, no one can fill that spot like you did. And if you if if you, they could, they would have your spot. But God gave you that spot. No one is meant to take your place. And that's what happens when we disqualify ourselves. And we always just say, God, I'm not qualified. God, I can't do this. God, this is just too hard. Everybody else makes it look so easy. And I can't. My ministry isn't growing. My ministry isn't changing. I feel discouraged all the time, and I feel tired all the time, and I feel like nobody cares. I'm putting in all this effort, and nobody cares. And God is saying, I care. One of the statements I always try to tell my team is, I care about you more than I care about what you can do for my church. Yeah. That's so good. And I think you guys need a reminder that God cares about you more than your position. If you are unhappy, if you are discouraged, if you are lacking creativity and ideas, if you are living in sadness that nobody knows about because you smile and you sing on stage and everyone thinks you're fine, you just work and push through it, God cares about those things. I don't want a basic cookie ministry. I want the best. I want it God-driven. I want it full of creativity. I want it fun. I want it honest. I want to be intentional. I want to be healthy, surrounded by people that are encouraging me and helping me to keep going. And I want to be well rested. Not just rested where I took a nap, <coughs> but rested in God's presence where God is able to speak to me. Because we get so busy, we don't let God speak to us. Yeah. We're like, okay, God, talk to me when I'm done. Once I finish all my tasks, then I'll sit with you and maybe you can give me a word. But I got most of it figured out, so I don't want Instead of sitting in God's presence first and saying, God, what do you want my ministry to look like? I've been doing it my way for a long time. And it's worked. But your talents can only take you so far. And sometimes I wonder if God is waiting for us to shift before he explodes through. So good. You can't get there because you're in the way. We got to step out of the way and say, okay, God, this has been my ministry. This has been what I've done. Help me do it your way. Yeah. Well, Father God, I pray over all of these leaders who are in here today. Lord. I thank you that you've given each of them talents. You've given each of them abilities and a position of authority in their church. They have influence. If they are in this room, they have influence over people in their church. And you are going to use them in a mighty way. I pray that this conference puts a fire in them. I pray that any depression, any sadness, any anxiety, any discouragement, any comparison, any fear, God, that they feel like they can't, they're not relevant or they can't do this anymore. Or they're not good enough or they're not talented or cool enough, God. I pray that you would remove those fears and remind them that you have called them. And nobody can take that from them. No one can take their calling. No one can take their position. You gave it to them. And you are going to equip them to do that job well. Lord, may we not get in the way. May we care about the details and the little things in our ministry so that it can be excellent. May we care about ourselves, God, so that we can be the best for our ministry. You love us, Lord. I pray that we would get to a position where we love ourselves too. And we believe what you say, that we can do this. I thank you. And I pray that they have a great time with the rest of this conference. And they steal a cookie on the way out. Do you say we pray? Amen. Amen. Amen.